Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India lecture 28 and we are going to talk about uh, spectral analysis of uh, explicit and implicit schemes. The specific content of this uh, lecture is uh, as follows. Um, we will be first uh, talking about how error propagates in convection dominated uh, physical systems. <coughs> that should set us up for uh, uh, requirement of uh, high accuracy schemes, what exactly we want to do with that. <coughs> and uh, once uh, that is discussed, we would uh, move over uh, and look at uh, certain explicit central schemes. Uh, we will look at it uh, from the physical plane point of view as well as in the spectral plane. Uh, the spectral plane will be indicated by the wave number k. And having done that, uh, we would uh, try to talk about uh, upwind schemes. So, we will realize that uh, many a times uh, central scheme by themselves would not be adequate and we would require some bit of uh, numerical dissipation coming through upwind schemes and uh, that is what uh, we need to represent and we will find out uh, what it is. Uh, once uh, we have done that representation, we will uh, look at uh, role of upwind schemes. Uh, what exactly it does and we would notice that uh, the role that it plays has a analog with uh, the negative feedback that we have in ele electrical circuits. So, that is what uh, will uh, show the connectivity of this concept with uh, negative feedback uh, stabilization of systems. <coughs> Having done that, uh, we have decided upon uh, the schemes, so whether we take uh, uh, central schemes with the explicit numerical dissipation added or the upwind schemes which has built in uh, implicit dissipation. Uh, next uh, job in uh, our view would be to really obtain the properties of numerical schemes and in uh, talking about the properties, we will be talking about the same three quantities that we talked about in the earlier lecture. That is uh, the first thing is the numerical uh, uh, amplification factor, it is a magnitude uh, that uh, we need to know about uh, to ascertain whether the system is uh, stable or not. Uh, along with uh, that, we need to find out what is the associated phase shift that uh, comes about with each uh, time step of integration and that will bring about uh, a numerical phase speed, which we have called here as uh, C n. And finally, uh, we would uh, look at uh, the group velocity and the group velocity is one of the most important parameter that we need to characterize the speed at which the energy in the system propagates and that is indicated by V g n. <coughs> okay. So, basically um, having uh, talked about the explicit schemes uh, in the following, we would uh, finally just uh, set up uh, some requirements uh, should we decide to adopt uh, similar high accuracy schemes in an implicit framework. So, let us uh, begin by uh, looking at uh, the error propagation equation. Uh, to understand it, we once again resort to studying that one dimensional convection equation, uh, which shows how the variable u uh, propagates uh, in space and time in one dimension and c is the phase speed. And as uh, we have noted uh, in our discussion on uh, waves, we have seen that this is a non-dispersive system. So, the energy also propagates with the same speed c, that also is the phase speed in this case. And uh, having decided uh, to adopt this equation uh, as our model equation, we can uh, obtain the numerical solution 
that we have uh, identified here by uh, you uh, sub subscript n and that uh, we take a difference of it from the exact solution and we call the quantity on the left hand side as the computational error. <coughs> the numerical solution that we obtain, uh, we could decide uh, to express it uh, in completely in the spectral plane in terms of the wave number k and uh, the circular frequency omega. Uh, that is one way of writing it, that is what we have done here. Uh, we have done here or alternatively we could write it in terms of those three parameters that we just now talked about, namely the amplitude of the amplification factor and uh, what do we mean by the amplification factor that will be apparent when we look at the last equation. Amplification factor basically tells you the from the Fourier Laplace uh, uh, representation that we have uh, shown here. Uh, if we uh, look at the Fourier Laplace amplitude at the advanced time step that is u of k plus uh, t plus delta t divided by u of uh, k at t, that would be our numerical amplification factor. So, the first part of the solution is the initial spectrum that is given by the initial condition of the solution. Uh, that should be uh, kept on uh, advanced in time given by the second factor which is nothing but mod of g raised to the power t by delta t. t by delta t actually gives you the number of time steps that we have essentially taken. right? So, at each time step it amplifies by a factor of mod g, either it amplifies or attenuates that would be determined by the property of mod g. And in addition, uh, this uh, complex g that we have uh, written here would also give rise to a phase shift at each time step and after n such time step, we have arrived at t equal to t. Uh, that would uh, give us a kind of a numerical phase speed that we have written here as c of n and then we are basically in this equation E 3, we are representing the solution in a sort of a hybrid fashion because the space x has been represented in terms of uh, the wave number k, but the time is retained as it is. So, if we uh, look at the expression that is given in the previous slide, we can immediately obtain the space derivative and the time derivative uh, one at a time and the expressions are given as they are. Uh, please note that uh, the fact that uh, in the previous uh, slide, the time dependence actually comes through the g term as well as uh, e, uh, the e to the power minus i k c and t term. It is for the same reason that when you take the time derivative, you end up with uh, two sets of term in E 5. So, what you could do is basically uh, use uh, the definition of the computational error that we shown uh, and try to set up uh, error propagation equation. Uh, the idea is simple, if the governing equation is given by this uh, differential operator on the left hand side here. So, we want to see the error also uh, does analogously the same thing or different. Uh, please note this is a linear equation given by the standard uh, work done by previous researchers. It was uh, conjectured that uh, the error would uh, follow the signal itself. Uh, However, uh, what we are showing here that if we represent the E as u minus u bar n, then uh, basically we will get two sets of terms in E 6 and you notice that uh, this set of term is uh, analytically is equal to 0. So, what happens is basically then the error is actually dictated by this two uh, terms that uh, comes about numerically. So, this is essentially the idea of setting up this error propagation equation. <coughs> so, that is what uh, we rewrite. If you uh, note that in the previous slide, uh, this right hand side had here c uh, and whereas, um, as we mentioned in computation what will happen 
is that c will be replaced by c of n, the numerical phase speed. So, that is why we have done this following manipulation. We wrote down the first line here in terms of c n and in the second uh, line, we have uh, subtracted it out and this is what we get. So, essentially then what we can say is the error is governed by the left hand side operator, which is forced by the following set of terms that is on the right hand side. And since we know what the expression for u bar of n is, so we can substitute uh, those quantities. And if we do that in E 7, we get this uh, following representation here. Okay. So, one set of term depends on the numerical phase speed, the other set of term depends on the modulus of g and look at the natural logarithm ap appearing over there. So, the last term uh, that we uh, had, last equation that we had, the phase dependent term we can uh, integrate by parts and we can see that uh, the equation furthermore simplifies in terms of this. Uh, you notice that uh, naturally a term comes uh, which is given here, which is nothing but d d k of uh, c of n. So, this basically uh, tells you that your original problem c was a constant and what we are noticing here that uh, we are uh, providing the possibility that c of n, the numerical phase speed uh, need not necessarily be a constant. It could be a function of the wave number itself and if that is so, that term uh, would be contributed by this last term given here on this equation E 9. <coughs> so, uh, basically uh, we are uh, looking at uh, uh, this expression and we can substitute it back uh, for this uh, set of term in the error propagation equation and we uh, come out uh, with uh, this uh, set of terms and we notice one thing very clearly that uh, the first set of term that we have here uh, depends on numerical amplification factor and uh, if the error has to be governed by the same equation as the signal itself, then we must uh, have modulus of g equal to 1. right? So, what it actually tells you very clearly is that if you really want a well behaved uh, algorithm then you must have modulus of g equal to 1. Any uh, numerical scheme for which modulus of g is not equal to 1 will contribute to forcing of error through this term. Okay? And the second set of term uh, tells you that your numerical phase speed is going to be a function of the wave number k. If it is so, that also will give rise to additional error. And this property where c of n is a function of x, oh sorry, function of k uh, is an attribute of a dispersive system. If c n was not a function of k, we would have called it a non dispersive system. Our original equation was a non dispersive equation because there c was constant. But here numerically, we have converted a non dispersive system to a theoretically a dispersive system. Now, individual algorithms will provide us an estimate for modulus of g and the expression of c n and from there we should be able to find out whether the method is the right one in terms of the error due to stability, instability or stability or error due to dispersion. Okay. So, having laid uh, this uh, gro ground work, we can now uh, state what exactly we really want to do if we want to perform high accuracy computing. First and foremost, uh, we uh, agree that uh, what we require that any space and time scale that is relevant for the physical problem, they, they have to be resolved. right? So, the first uh, term is uh, very obvious. We need to resolve all physical time and length scales. <coughs> now, the second term is what I just now described to you that we need to have mod g equal to 1. That means, we need to have a neutrally stable system. We cannot uh, have instability, of course, then the solution will blow up, you will immediately know. But what is not uh, always realized that you cannot also have 
so called stable dissipative system. The basic idea is the following that numerics should not impose its role on the physics of the problem. So, numerics should stay neutral, physics should dictate whether the system is stable or unstable. So, that is why numerically we do not want to add any dissipation, this is absolutely unwarranted. <coughs> Now, uh, we also seen in the previous slide that there is another source of error that is where the numerical phase speed uh, becomes a function of wave number and we said that is a hallmark of a dispersive system. We do not even want that and that is what we have stated in the point 3 that each and every wave number component should propagate uh, its uh, phase and energy at the correct speed and that I have stated to you that is the group velocity. So, we will go ahead and figure out how these things are evaluated and we will find out how to avoid spurious dispersion. Okay? <coughs> so, that is uh, that, these are the three prime requirement of high accuracy computing system. <coughs> Next, uh, what we also realize that um, when we are replacing a differential equation by its uh, discrete version we are essentially uh, indulging in some amount of truncation of terms and that error is what is called as a truncation error. Uh, it has become uh, quite commonplace for anyone and everyone to look at the property of the numerical scheme in the physical space and uh, then people try to talk about the order of the discretization and it is hoped that you have a higher the order of the discretization, lower will be the error. However, um, this is uh, somewhat misleading because uh, the error of course, uh, uh, behaves uh, like this. Suppose, I have a nth order system. So, that would uh, be given by, uh, uh, given by a term which will be dependent on the order of the system and there could be probably say n factorial term coming in there and then what we could have uh, is uh, that we will have say associated uh, higher derivative term. Uh, what is uh, basically uh, done in most of the time when you uh, look at higher order uh, accurate system you are basically uh, talking about uh, this term. You expect that uh, if this exponent is high, delta x being small, the contribution will be small. But the essential point remains that what we need to look at is a basically product of the two. It may so happen that I have n equal to 6, then this is ok, uh, then I am looking at this but I can derive another scheme where uh, I, I would have a term here uh, which is let us say instead of 5 it becomes let us say 2, but then the associated term there would become let us say the third derivative and for that particular physical problem the third derivative could be much much lower than this quantity. There is no guarantee that higher the order of this term lower is the magnitude. In fact, in most of the physical system, it happens the other way. If you look at the higher order derivatives, they also carry higher amplitude. This you can very clearly understand if you look at uh, uh, a term like this and if I write its uh, Fourier representation, then I would be writing like this and if I try to figure out it is a nth derivative, then uh, what I am going to get would be nothing but i k raised to the power n and u of k e to the power i k x d k. So, you can see higher the n, of course, you are going to get higher contribution coming from higher wave numbers. So, this is quite easily understood that uh, this root of characterizing schemes by uh, order of the term uh, in terms of the grid spacing is erroneous. 
what instead one should look at its representation in the spectral plane. If the neglected term is negligible or not, if it is negligible you are done. So, we are going to take uh, that kind of an approach and what we uh, see that uh, many a times that uh, you could uh, derive schemes which are formally lower order, but they are truly uh, higher order from the perspective of its behavior in the spectral plane. <coughs> now, let us uh, explore this uh, for some simple example. For example, let us say we are uh, interested in uh, discretizing the first derivative term and that is important uh, in uh, many physical systems. So, let us begin with the first derivative. Suppose, we perform a second order central difference schemes uh, that is given by equation 1 here and you can see that it is uh, related to its uh, neighboring point i plus 1 j minus i minus 1 j uh, divided by 2 h and the highest uh, order uh, uh, truncation error term is proportional to h square uh, by 3 factorial and this is the third derivative and rest of it is order 4 and above. <coughs> uh, the same way we can also uh, uh, obtain a fourth order scheme uh, that would involve more number of points. The essential point that you notice that migrating from a second uh, uh, order scheme to a fourth order scheme, your stencil size becomes bigger. For example, equation 1 involves 3 points, equation 2 involves 5 points and if you look at the corresponding sixth order system, it actually involves 7 points. Uh, this is the essential feature of explicit scheme. You want to go higher order, your stencil size increases and we will talk about why this may not be always good to go for higher and higher order schemes. Now, if I want to view these central schemes in uh, k plane, then what I can do is I can uh, represent a function, let us say f of x and t uh, in this uh, hybrid manner, uh, re retain the time dependence as it is and introduce uh, uh, k instead of x and then we perform this integral. <coughs> if we use a uniform grade, then uh, what we usually do is we represent the second derivative like this that we just now seen and if we now substitute 4 in equation 5. Uh, noticing that x is equal to m times delta x, then I would get the uh, Fourier amplitude retained as it is and in the phase I will write e to the power i k m plus 1 delta x minus e to the power i k m minus 1 delta x. And you notice that e to the power i k x is nothing but e to the power i k m delta x. Okay? So, what happens as a consequence? Uh, we uh, get uh, an expression for uh, we get an expression for uh, k equivalent. Uh, let, let, let me explain what this k equivalent is. Um, if I represent uh, u of x and t in terms of u of k and t e to the power i k x decay, then uh, del u del x can be very easily written as i k u e to the power i k x decay. So, this is your exact representation, right. And what we just now seen that uh, numerically what we got, numerically we got u of k written as it is and we had obtained e to the power i k delta x uh, minus e to the power minus i k delta x by 2 h and then we had e to the power i k x that was m delta x, right. That is what we say that is our x and d k. So, what happens here? Uh, this is your numerical representation. 
So, what you are noticing that in getting the exact representation what you did, you had the Fourier uh, amplitude, you just simply multiplied by i k to get the derivative. right? So, if I look at this, I could write this equation also in terms of u of k as it is and this quantity that we have here, let me write it as i k equivalent. Okay, and then we have e to the power i k x d k. <clears throat> so, what happens? You see, uh, doing the numerical operation is equivalent to repre replacing i k by i k equivalent. Right? And what is this i k equivalent? i k equivalent is this quantity, and what is this? 2 i sin k delta x. Right? by 2 h. So, that I will get equal to i sin k delta x uh, divided by, well, uh, I am mixing up. So, instead of h, let me write this as delta x. So, I am going to get this as uh, equal to i k delta x by delta x. Okay. So, uh, what happens is then, uh, of course, uh, you can get rid of this, and then uh, this is an expression that we have derived it for CD2 scheme, right? So, what we are going to write here as k equivalent by k uh, for the CD2 scheme is going to be sin k delta x by k delta x. Okay. So, we can uh, carry on with this exercise for C D 4 and C D 6 scheme and what we uh, notice is that, uh, notice is that uh, we can get some expression for k equivalent by k for C D 6 scheme given by sin 3 k delta x etcetera etcetera. Uh, that is given by your equation 8. So, we are collecting expressions for this in the k plane. Now, let me tell you about a method that was developed here few years ago, where we actually wanted to develop a 9 point schemes. So, we, we want to explore a 9 point scheme, but uh, what we wanted to do was we wanted to optimize the scheme, so that the error of this 9 point scheme is much lower than many explicit schemes. So, basically what you do is uh, what I have written down in this uh, equation A, that uh, I will write the d u l d x, uh, that would be a naught by 2 h and you can see the terms appear pair wise, time terms appear pair wise for example, L plus 1 and L minus 1 are coupled together. The same way L plus 2 and L minus 2 terms are coupled here and uh, you can see that without the presence of U L, we have 9 points there. Now, uh, how does this uh, scheme behave or how we go ahead and do it? That is what we are uh, going to see that uh, We uh, have written down those expression in the physical plane. Now, what we could do is on the left hand side, we have d u d x, on the right hand side, we have those 9 points. So, we can write down the Taylor series and match term by term. And when we do that, we are going to get various uh, odd derivative terms, even derivative terms will all become 0. Why? Because uh, you can see that the way these terms appear pairwise with a minus sign in between. So, if you do a Taylor series, this will only return the odd derivatives, all even derivative terms drop out and then you successively uh, sort of equate the odd derivatives, all kinds of derivatives on the left and right hand side and write everything in terms of one of the parameter. Here, we have used a naught as the parameter and matching the Taylor series, 
we get expression for B naught, D naught and E naught in terms of the parameter A naught. Okay. <clears throat> now, what we want to do is as we have seen here, uh, derivative first derivative is given in terms of uh, i k u for the exact quantity and for the numerical quantity is i k equivalent u. So, the error would be difference of the two and that is what we have written in this uh, equation c. If you look at equation c, that is the error, the difference between exact and numerical uh, estimate. <coughs> now, uh, what you could do is of course, uh, we have the expression uh, here and we can use that okay use that in the expression for the derivative that we have written there in the previous uh, slide uh, that uh, what we can uh, see here given in uh, this equation and so what we could do is basically uh, we could uh, substitute that uh, fourier laplace series and we'll get this expression that we have indicated here okay <coughs> now your problem is uh, set you have the expression in C that is going to be a function of what only a naught. So, what we did was optimize this error as a function of a naught and we have uh, done one two things we have taken u of k equal to 1 that is uh, true for delta function excitation okay? uh, that is the most conservative estimate one can get and the other thing is we did not go the full limit from 0 to pi instead we have taken a limit which is slightly lower than pi. Okay. In performing this uh, optimization in uh, equation C, we end up getting a value of A naught. Okay. So, we have now introduced uh, uh, some schemes here and they are essentially plotted here. Uh, what you are seeing is a host of method. Uh, the purple color is the CD2 method that uh, gives you that k equivalent by k. It is the performance parameter, right? Ideally, we want it to be equal to 1. And what we are noticing here that uh, CD2 scheme falls off from the ideal limit for a very small value of kh itself. What is kh? kh is nothing but non dimensional k. k. k is a wave number its a dimension is 1 over length and h is delta x which has a dimension of length. So, k h is non dimensional and that we have shown it in a limit of 0 to pi. Okay. Now, once you see that uh, you notice that um, we have uh, shown here the C D 2 scheme, C D 4 scheme is shown by the green line which is shown here, U D 3 is a uh, third order upwind scheme which you are going to subsequently define, but please take a note at this uh, SS scheme that we just now obtained as a optimization exercise and you can see its performance. It, it is 9 point, it is a 9 point formula, but what happened in uh, getting those conditions for Taylor series, we actually have matched up to 6 order. So, basically it is a 9 point, but it is 6 order scheme because that is how we match the Taylor series because we kept a naught floating. However, this k equivalent by k that we have plotted here against k h, this performance parameter is better than if you would have taken a C D 8 scheme because that is what we want to do because you have taken a 9 point and what you really want is a benefit that is more than that you could get with a C D 8 scheme. And that is what we mentioned that you should not focus your attention in the physical plane, instead you should look at in the spectral plane. And that is what we are seeing in the k plane, this nominal sixth order scheme performs better than an eighth order scheme. And these are, this is basically an explicit scheme. I have purposely drawn another uh, line here which is shown here by this black line. Uh, this is an implicit scheme that should motivate us to look for them and it as it appears here that this implicit scheme is 
far more accurate than this explicit scheme. We are going to uh, talk about it as we go along. Okay. So, now if I uh, try to see its uh, usage, try to see its usage for all this derivative operation, um, we want to compute a real flow at high Reynolds number. It, if we use the central scheme, it may not work, uh, because what happens is uh, the properties, combined properties of the space time discretization will show that such schemes, central schemes are susceptible to very high wave number error. So, you need to stabilize your numerical method against those high wave number error. One of the way of uh, utilizing upwind scheme is to introduce numerical dissipation that prevents numerical instability. This is the motivation for abandoning uh, explicit scheme and instead going for in, I mean upwind scheme. Explicit central scheme will be abandoned in favor of explicit upwind scheme. And um, we have to be careful, because we have already seen in the derivation of the error evolution equation that in our GIL, if we want to make the method stable, we can also introduce error. So, that is what we have to uh, be careful that even stable algorithm uh, creates error. So, we will have to worry about it and that is why we have said very clearly that we need numerical stable algorithm. right? And so, if taking upwind scheme is an absolute must, we have to uh, be rather careful in adding just the right amount of dissipation, which will take away those high wave number errors, while it should not tamper with the physical nature of the problem. That is what we want to make a comment here, that we do not want to make the system overstable. That is something we must uh, be careful of. Okay. <clears throat> so, what does uh, upwinding uh, does? Again, let us try to explore it with the help of our model equation, that uh, convection equation that we have shown here, del u del t plus uh, c into del u del x. Now, let us uh, take one of the simplest possible upwind scheme. You have noticed that all central schemes are even ordered. Okay? We have looked at the C D 2, C D 4, C D 6, etcetera, where the stencils were symmetric and we always ended up having even ordered scheme. So, if we uh, look at the first order scheme, then what happens? Let me uh, explain this somewhat better, because we are uh, looking at a, a problem, where uh, our governing equation tells us that uh, the signal is propagating from left to right, right? Because C is positive, so if I give some kind of a initial condition in the XT plane, and if I give some kind of a initial solution like this, what happens with the passage of time? This condition will move to the right. So at a later time, I might see that uh, this solution has moved here. This is the property of uh, this equation, that it does not amplify or dissipate, and it also does not disperse. So, if I have a packet like this, the packet is retained as it is. Okay? So, what happens if I try to uh, solve an equation like this using first order upwinding scheme? That is what you are noticing here that I have uh, purposely uh, looked at the del f del x at the mth node. So, where is the information coming from? It is going from left to right. So, what I should do is, I should write an expression which should involve the mth node and uh, with the m minus 1 th node. So, this is what we are going to do. We have an expression for f, 
that we have seen in terms of Fourier Laplace series, that is what we have done in equation 9. Okay, so, we just now seen that uh, if we follow the physical nature while discretizing through the equation 9, we are actually following the correct trend, because information is propagating from m minus 1th point to the mth point and that is precisely what we need to do. And again using the Fourier series, uh, Fourier Laplace series, what we can see that we can work out the k equivalent by k. You can work it out and what you would notice that it has a real path, which looks exactly like what we had obtained for the C D 2 scheme. In addition, you have an imaginary path. The imaginary path actually is the numerical dissipation that we have added, added to the scheme. Okay. Why I am saying numerical dissipation, which we can show it subsequently, but what we can do is basically uh, having obtained this uh, scheme here del f uh, del x. So, what we could do is basically uh, if I am writing uh, this, I will be writing here u, we are looking at the mth node. So, I will be writing here like this u m n by delta t. So, this is my Euler time integration for the time derivative and then I will be adding C u m n minus. Now, we are doing first order upwinding, right. So, that is why I am writing it like this. So, I can write down the Taylor series, uh, sorry the uh, Fourier Laplace uh, uh, transform and then what we are going to do is we are going to write if you remember, we have uh, introduced that as u of x n t n, we have written it like uh, u of k t of n, we will write it as e to the power i k x m d k, right. That is that is our expression. Uh, Fourier Laplace transform expression for the variable. So, I can substitute it there. So, what we are going to get is basically from here I will get u of k t n plus 1 uh, and from here I will get u of k t of n and this is divided by delta t and c what am I going to get here? What I have just now written here this is the expression that is given. So, what we are going to get? So, this whole thing that we are writing comes under the integral sign. We are performing integral over all k and so here I am going to get c by delta x and what do I get? Here it will be 1 minus e to the power minus i k delta x into u of k t n. This whole thing I am going to multiply with respect to this, right. So, that is what we are writ we have written here. So, it has been multiplied by e to the power i k x d k. So, since this whole thing is equal to 0, the integrand must be 0. So, what we have done essentially then we have uh, basically then uh, say that the integrand itself must be equal to 0 and that is what we are going to write equal to 0 as. Now, if I divide this equation by u of k t n, then this term will give me g that is the definition of g. Remember g of k t n is nothing but u of k t n plus 1 by u of k of t n. So, if I divide this equation by uh, u of k t n, then what we are going to get is the following. We are going to get here g minus 1 
and if I take this, what do I get? C delta t by delta x is our CFL number. So, that is going to be our CFL number N C. Okay? So, this is a well known CFL number which you have talked about many a times before. So, we are not surprised and in addition we are getting here 1 minus e to the power minus i k delta x i equal to 0. So, you have an expression for g. Okay? So, what we do is having obtained the expression for g, we can plot it and this plot is a very fascinating plot because uh, it says very clearly that uh, you have a vertical line corresponding to n c equal to 1. To the right of that line, the method is unstable. Everywhere g is greater than 1. So, there is absolutely no mystery here that if you are adopting this method, never try the value of n c greater than 1. If you do take n c less than 1, then you can see that for different wave number are going to be attenuated by different amount. A higher the value of k h, higher is the attenuation. Whereas, if you take n c exactly equal to 1, what you are getting? g is equal to 1 everywhere and that is your exact solution. So, what we have learned that upwinding by itself is not bad provided you do it physically and here doing it physically is equivalent to taking n c equal to 1. So, you understand that there is nothing wrong with upwinding per se, but if you overdo it say instead of taking n c, n c means what? It is a measure of c times delta t. So, delta t it basically tells you a time step that you are taking. So, if you take a time step which is too small, then you do not get generally more accuracy. Here it shows very clearly to get the maximum accuracy, you will have to take delta t is equal to delta x by c. That means what? Every time step your solution is travelling by one node and that is the definition of phase speed c. So, you can very clearly uh, appreciate what has been achieved here. That you do get exact solution for n c equal to 1. If you take more than 1, you are unstable. If you are less than 1, it is stable, but it will be erroneous. Then, we can uh, plot this uh, c n by c. See, basically what we have written down here, g as uh, given here. So, this could be written down also in terms of like a modulus of g that is what we plotted in the previous slide and then we can also get its phase which I write as beta j. What is beta j? Beta j is given by tan beta j would be nothing but g is complex right. So, d g is complex. So, we get g imaginary by g real. So, I get this. So, what, what does it mean that whenever I am actually numerically integrating, I am amplifying or attenuating by mod g and the solution is shifting its phase. That is what it is doing. It is moving to the right. So, every time step I need its phase to shift and that numerical phase shift is given in terms of what you have gotten the value of g as. Now, once you have gotten the value of g there, and the in consequence you have gotten the value of beta j, we have shown it already that beta of j is nothing but equal to uh, can be related to uh, c n by c. So, c n is the numerical phase speed that we can uh, show that uh, c n by c will be beta j by omega times delta t. Okay. So, once you have uh, obtained the uh, beta j, you can calculate numerical phase speed. So, they are all related. So, the basic task is choose your numerical algorithm, obtain the value of g, collect its real and imaginary path, obtain c n by c. The same way you can also get uh, 
your V g n by C that should be equal to 1 by C delta T on d beta j d k. This is what we have uh, discussed when we are talking about uh, uh, hyperbolic equation. What you notice here is the in this uh, C n by C contour plot also a beautiful thing that for n c equal to 1, you have C n by C equal to 1. That is exactly what you want that that should be equal to 1. Numerical phase speed should be equal to the physical phase speed. Well, it is rather interesting that even for a value of n c equal to half also you get the same quantity, but we have seen in the previous slide that there you will have g property that is not desirable. So, we notice that and the same thing you can uh, look at in terms of the group velocity also. Uh, the V g n uh, is exactly equal to c what it should be for n c equal to 1. So, this is essentially the idea by which we can uh, really work out. Now, let us uh, look at the consequence of this u d 1 scheme. I told you that uh, k equivalent has a real part and imaginary part. So, that is what we have written down here in equation 11. Uh, we have shown it uh, the real part gives rise to this, which is like your C D 2 scheme that we have uh, noticed before. This imaginary part actually gives you a added dissipation. Why? Because on the left hand side I have this term. Now, if I have some quantity, a positive quantity with a negative sign, I put it on this side, then I am going to get this term that is what a positive quantity k i square right k i square times f. So, this actually plays this role. If you act, if you have the uh, Fourier Laplace transform representation of a function, you do it uh, take the second derivative two de derivative twice, then you end up getting an expression of that kind minus k square u of k. So, this is exactly what has been achieved. It is it's, it's a rather interesting thing that to get a solution which is numerically correct, we added up some numerical dissipation which was not there, but we have chosen in such a way that delta t and delta x in such a way that we have kept n c equal to 1 and we have achieved a perfect solution. So, basically uh, once we have made this case for first order upwinding case, what we have shown? If I look at the first order upwinding case, that first order upwinding case is equivalent to uh, doing this here. This is your uh, C D 2 scheme on the left hand side and to that you have added a second derivative term that is your first order upwinding. So, we can generalize it say for example, we generalize it to a third order upwind scheme. So, third order upwind scheme will be I will take the derivative here a fourth uh, central difference scheme and to that I will add a fourth derivative that is your third order upwind scheme. You can successively generate fifth order, seventh order scheme so on so forth. So, where we can now already uh, have seen what del f del x c d 4 expression is. Here I have uh, shown you what this fourth derivative expression is in terms of that and if you substitute all of that together, your del u del x by third order upwind scheme is given by equation 15. Okay. So, this has been done for a case where the signal is propagating from left to right. Okay. Having done that, we have the Fourier Laplace series and we can substitute it and we will get the real part of k equivalent by k for u d 3 will be exactly same as c d 4. In addition, what we will get an imaginary part and that is what is shown in equation 16. So, one can work it out and one can see that third order upwinding is equivalent to adding this uh, term and this is what you get to see if you plot all the k imaginary by k plot against k h. If you look at uh, all central schemes, 
they all fall along 0 line. These are what you get for all uh, the central schemes. Whereas, uh, this brown line is for first upwind scheme uh, and this is your third upwind scheme. What you notice interestingly enough that uh, there is a qualitative difference. Third order upwind scheme start become active at relatively higher wave number, whereas first order upwind scheme become active right from the beginning. So, what we could do is uh, we can try to rationalize what upwinding is doing. Upwinding, let us say we look at some kind of evolution equation like this, then we can think of L of u includes all the spatial derivatives and we can represent it. And then what we could do is we can write down the spatially discretized scheme like equation 18. And you see there are all kinds of terms involved here. K goes from 0 to n, n determined by the order of the scheme. We have seen that if we take a second order scheme, we need 3 points. If we take fourth order scheme, we need 5 points. If we need sixth order scheme, we need 7 points. So, n is determined by the order. And uh, what we have done? We have done a similar analysis for space time dependent equation and we can work it out in that particular fashion. So, basically the disc discrete equation, uh, what we really need is uh, it should be stable. But what we find that central schemes are uh, neutral sta neutrally stable because just now we have seen that k equivalent by k imaginary is 0. So, it does not add any dissipation, it is neutrally stable. But if there are numerical instabilities at high wave number due to some high k source, then we need to suppress that. Okay. <clears throat> what happens in case of a central scheme? You always see oscillations with uh, wavelength 2 delta x and this is the highest wave number that you can resolve with that grid. If I have uh, grid points like this, this is the smallest wavelength wave that I can represent. right? So, that is what uh, we are seeing. So, the oscillation is related to 2 delta x. Now, if I write down the corresponding uh, error equation, which is not very trivial, um, to control this uh, oscillation at 2 delta x, what we really understand that the central schemes are insensitive to the node point we are looking at. However, if I do upwinding, I notice that the schemes uh, as we have seen here, if I am looking at the mth point, there is a term here which involves the mth point itself which is not there in central schemes. So, whenever you do upwinding, you get this term and when you get this term, you actually can write down the error equation which will involve this term. So, that means, the error at the lth node is coupled to the error at the lth point itself and if suppose p is 0, I could integrate it and I can show that e of l goes as e to the power alpha t minus exponent. So, if alpha is positive, then this is going to show that the error is going to decay with time. So, that is the whole key to stabilizing schemes that you need to add a term in such a way that it provides this minus alpha of this guy and this is what exactly you decide by this. Okay. So, I suppose you can get some of these plots as it is shown here, numerical amplification factor for some of the schemes C D 2, C D 4, U D 3 and this S S schemes that we have talked about. Same way we can work out the expression for C n by C and we can work out the expression for uh, V g n by C. So, this is your phase speed representation and here you have the group velocity representation. Uh, what you notice is uh, certain properties um, which uh, we will be exploring once again when we talk about compact scheme in a later time. Okay. So, I think I will uh, just uh, stop at this point and uh, we will uh, get back to a framework where we will be talking about 
compact schemes which are essentially implicit schemes which perform some of this task that we have set up today in a better manner that is what will be taken up from next lecture onwards.